Okay, so let's start with pediatrics today. Um, pediatrics is important. Uh, some topics are very important. Some things they ask frequently. Most of you will get questions from them. So I'll highlight those and I'll tell you what is important. Okay. Otherwise, all of the pediatric is important. There's nothing that is not important overall, if you see. So first thing comes the immunization. Immunization, you should know this um, uh, schedule. Everybody has to learn it by heart. Okay. So I can't do anything for it. You should know at what age, at what month, what immunizations we are giving. What question they can give you about immunization is like it can be a CDM question or any um, um, uh, MCQ question. Different questions can come. Number one, they might give you a question like a parent, uh, parents are bringing in a child for immunization on history. Everything is fine. The child has been immunized. What will you tell the parents now? So what do we have to or what is your next step? So we'll just reassure them regularly like we take our children and the nurse tells us that okay the child might have some fever you can give her um, um, Tylenol for that and there might be some redness there might be some um, rash if there is something um, um, a shortness of breath or any aller uh, allergy then you have to come back right so that is what we have to tell the parents otherwise there's no specific thing just reassure the parents and tell them about uh, if there's any um, pain any fever uh, prescribe uh, Tylenol okay along with that uh, any child with sickle cell disease, asplenia, hyposplenia, we should know that there is no contraindication to vaccinations. They are vaccinated according to the normal uh, routine vaccinations. And along with that, what um, do we give them? We add uh, this meningococcal C vaccine and B vaccine. Along with that, um, uh, what is that? Pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. So these uh, are the additional we have to add. Otherwise, they, there is no contraindication if in a scenario they're giving a child with sickle cell disease is coming and which vaccine is contraindicated. None is contraindicated. Okay, we have to uh, um, immunize them in, with the routine schedule. Okay, another thing is like a, a, a mother or a father bringing in a child for vaccination and on history, you find them that the child had a history of intersusception or the child had a history of Meckel's diverticulum. So uh, at that point, what is contraindicated? If they're bringing them in for rotavirus vaccination, we have to tell them that it is contraindicated. We, the child cannot get the vaccine. So you should know this uh, contraindication to rotavirus. It can be a CDM question or uh, MCQ question. A child coming in with uh, for uh, rotavirus vaccination, what are the questions you're uh, asking the parents uh, on history? So we have to ask history of interception, any history of Meckel's diverticulum. We have to ask these uh, questions. We know that MMR, varicella, these are uh, contraindicated in pregnancy. We will not give them in pregnancy. Uh, similarly, Tdap has to be given in every pregnancy. So that is the main contraindication you should know. Another uh, uh, scenario they can give you that uh, parents, immigrant parents are coming in uh, for a first time visit and on further um, um, history or uh, further questioning, you find out that the children are not vaccinated or they do not want to vac vaccinate them. So what is the uh, next step? Next step will be, we will inquire more about why they do, uh, did not vaccinate the parents. Then we have to counsel them, okay? First, inquire more. Why didn't uh, they did not uh, vaccinate? What What is making them resistant? Then uh, counsel them about the vaccination, about the effect, uh, advantages of the vaccination. Uh, there can be a question that uh, the, uh, the parent is coming in with a, um, that uh, I've heard that uh, children uh, who get vaccinated, they have autism. Later in life, they present with autism. So you have to reassure the parents and tell them that there's no such thing and vaccinations are safe. Another question can be like, um, the, now if they are asking, okay, we are ready to vaccinate the child, but the child hasn't been vaccinated. The child is nine years old, 10 years old. And uh, what to do now? The uh, 
the vaccination starts at birth. So we have to counsel them, tell them that there is no specific age. We can put them, uh, refer you to the uh, special programs, which are the catch-up programs. We can refer you to the nurses and according to their age, they will put them on a catch-up program and there they will be vaccinated uh, accordingly. Okay. And even if they, uh, they are telling the parents are not vaccinated, then we have to counsel the parents also that they should also get uh, vaccinated. Okay. So, yes, this is all about vaccination. There are questions they can ask you in CDM or in MCQs. Then we have the uh, reflexes. Okay. What are the Primitive reflexes, these these are all the primitive reflexes, Moro, Gallant, Grasp, ATNR, Stepping, Rooting, Lateral Propping. Any of this reflex, if they are presenting or bringing in a child above six months of age or four to six months of age, more than that, and he has any of this reflex, then it means that there is some underlying abnormality and we have to check them because these are the reflexes which after maximum after six months, like ATNR, motor reflex, they disappear. If after six hours still the reflexes are present, it means that there is some underlying, maybe cerebral palsy, some neurological problem going on in the child, which we have to exclude. Okay. So the primitive reflexes responsible uh, uh, responses are abnormal if absent during neonatal period, asymmetric or persistent after four to six months. Okay, so mostly if they give you a question, they won't say that it is absent. They will give you a scenario in which the child is above six months of age and he still has that uh, reflex. Or maybe a child um, 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 below the age and presenting with uh, a three-month-old child coming and he's able to turn himself uh, in the bed. Okay, from one side to another. So a three-month-old child cannot do that uh, by himself. So maybe there is something abnormal which we have to find out. Tender reflex responses, asymmetry suggests focal uh, motor lesions, for example, brachial plexus injury and absence of or hyperreflexia may suggest CNS abnormalities. Upgoing planters, normal in infants up to two years of age. Okay, so in infants, upgoing planters up to two years of age is normal. Otherwise, in adults, if there's upgoing planters, so it is some upper motor neuron, neuron lesion. Okay. Then the gross, uh, this milestones, it's very hard to uh, remember all of them that at this age, this is um, the child develops this milestone at this age, this, but we should know the rough estimate of nine months and 18 months. These are important, okay? So what the child is doing uh, till nine months and what he's, he or she is able to do at 18 months, these are important. They can give you a, a scenario asking that the child is presenting at nine months and the parents are bringing him. They're worried that the child doesn't speak or just say one to two words or the child is uh, not uh, walking right now. So what will we do? We'll just reassure the parents that it's normal, nothing to worry about. 18 months old child uh, bringing, uh, brought in by the parents, not walking um, or not saying any words, then uh, we have to uh, further question or further inquire, okay, why isn't the child walking, okay? Then the red flags are a gross motor not walking at 18 months rolling too early at less than three months. Uh, fine motor hand preference as less than 18 months. Speech less than six words at 18 months. Social, not smiling at four months, not pointing at 15 to 18. So you should know these red flags. If you know red flags, then if they give you any scenario, you would know whether it is normal or abnormal, okay? And then rest they have this given there. For nutrition, we should know if the child is um, a neonate, mother bringing them in, she's uh, breastfeeding them exclusively, we have to add vitamin D. Any premature infant coming in, mother bringing in a premature infant, what uh, are the things we are giving them? We are giving them vitamin D along with iron supplement. In premature, we always add iron supplement for one year of life. Okay, remember that. So if it's a normal term infant, just breast, uh, just on breast milk, then add vitamin D. If preterm, then add both of these, iron and vitamin D. 
then we have to ask like um, the parents might come in that is it okay to introduce any um, allergenic food to the child earlier in life so just tell them that it is okay reassure them nothing if there's no family history of any allergies no history of allergy then it is uh, okay to introduce uh, allergenic foods like any nuts any fish all of these things we can add early in life um along with that what do we have to avoid up till uh, 12 months of age, we don't have to give the child honey due to increased risk of botulism. We do not have to give them cow milk. Okay, up till one year of uh, life, cow milk is not allowed. A mother bringing in a child uh, nine months of uh, nine years of age and she uh, the uh, child is on cow milk. What do we have to exclude or we have to check the child for iron deficiency anemia because cow milk causes iron deficiency anemia if introduced earlier in life. So if the mother is coming in, we have to counsel her that do not introduce cow milk up till one year of life. And along with that, um, don't give any uh, honey. Um, another scenario they can give you is like um, mother bringing in a child nine months old and uh, she feeds him. Everything is normal. And on a history, the mother tells that the child is being given grapes or uh, sausages um, along with that, any other mashed uh, potatoes, uh, mashed vegetables. So what do we have to counsel the mother or what is the next step? So we have to counsel the mother to stop or don't give the child grapes okay, or sausages because of the risk of choking. So in small children, less than 12 years of age, there can be a choking hazard from fruits like grapes or sausages, etc. So we have to counsel her. We have to tell her that uh, do not give this to uh, the child because of the risk of he or she can choke themselves. For breast milk, you should know the advantages. What are the contraindications? Advantages are easily digestible, low renal solute load, then uh, less risk of any allergies, asthmas, um, less risk of diarrhea, respiratory illness, acute otitis media, contains IgA, macrophages, um, lower pH promotes growth of lactobacillus in the GI tract, okay, which is good, which prevents diarrhea and is good for the GI. So we have to, we should know all these um, advantages. Along with this, what are the contraindications? scenario can come about the contraindications we already discussed this i think in family medicine that uh, or in ethics like when we have to uh, uh, tell the mother not to feed the baby or when she has to feed the baby so the absolute contraindications are hiv uh, human t lymphocytic virus type 1 and 3 and infant galactosemia Relative, our mother has chemotherapy, radioactive compounds, or certain medications known to cross the breast milk with neonatal effect. So, what are the med uh, medications? Antimetabolite, chloramphenicol, dizepam, ergot, gold, metronidazole, tetracycline, lithium, and cyclophosphamide. So, these are the medications which uh, cross the breast milk. And if mother is on any of these medications, we have to tell her that she sh should not uh, breastfeed the baby. A, mo uh, a mother coming to you at two months, three months on OCPs asking whether she can uh, breastfeed the baby or no. So th that is not a contraindication. She can breastfeed the baby. OCPs are not a contraindication to breastfeeding. Okay, so just remember that any active tuberculosis, active herpes simplex to lesion on the breast. If the herpes simplex lesion is on the breast, then we have to tell her that, okay, you cannot breastfeed the baby, just pump the milk and give it to the baby. If it is somewhere else, then she can breastfeed. Uh, mother bringing in a child uh, with uh, some um, uh, white patches in the mouth and herself giving the history of cracked nipples. What is that? That is thrush. In this, we will treat both the mother and the baby. We will tell her, uh, we will give her um, niacinamide drops, antifungal drops for the baby. And for the nipples, we can give her some antifungal cream along with that some um, um uh, moisturizers and vaseline etc also we will have to counsel about the hygiene to sterilize the bottles and um, if using any bottles sterilize those and every time before feeding clean the uh, uh, nipple area we have to counsel her about all these things so if a, a baby coming in with thrush remember we have to treat both the mother and the baby 
how to assess if uh, the baby has any signs of dehydration or less than normal um, uh, wet diapers. Just remember, on first day of birth, the baby will have one wet diaper, okay? Second day, two wet diapers. This is normal. On third day, three, four, four, okay, so on. So up till six days or seven days, there will be six or seven diapers. And after that, there will be six or seven diapers per day. So if less than that, a mother bringing in a child 10 days old with two diapers per day, then we have to uh, check the baby for any signs of dehydration or underlying cause. But if the uh, mother is bringing in a five-day-old baby and she says that uh, the wet diapers are five, then it is fine, okay? So up till six um, days, um, it is six diapers, up till seven days, actually, seven diapers per day. After that, it is same, six to seven diapers per day. But less than that, each according to the age, the number of the diaper. Then circumcision, um, it is all like uh, cultural or religious based. So it is not a um, necessity that everybody has to get circumcised. But if somebody is bringing in a child, um, a family who believes in circumcision and they want to undergo it, then we will do it for them. But uh, before that, we have to look for any contraindications. What are the contraindications? Any bleeding disorder or any hypospadias. Okay, in hypospadias, the urethral opening will be on the ventral side. So if there are no contraindications and they have a cultural belief, then we will go with it. It is not that every child has to be circumcised. Okay, then breath holding spell. It is simple in breath holding spell, in crying or fussy baby, we just have to tell the parents that, uh, just reassure them that it is normal and it is age related and with age, it is um, the child is going to outcome it. What are breath holding uh, spells? That at the age of six to four years, the child, they become very, anything, they become angry or frustrated on, then they cry so much that they hold their breath and after some time, some child, the children, they even faint. Okay, they become blue, paler, and they faint. So this is breath holding spell. Just tell the parents, reassure them that it is going to um, resolve on its own and nothing else. Okay, there's no. And also, it can there can be an underlying cause like iron deficiency anemia. So we can do their CBC and provide them with a supplemental iron if given. Okay, that the CBC is low what to do next, reassure and provide with supplemental iron. Crying or fussing baby, um, if normal child coming in, the parents are bringing a child two years of age, that the child is uh, becomes very fussy or shows uh, tantrums on small things, then just reassure the parents that at that time, uh, do not entertain the child, okay? So it's a normal childhood behavior, which he or she will overcome. Infantile colic, um, very common uh, problem. Most of the mothers, they face it. So what is infantile colic? You just know this uh, three, the vessels criteria. More than three hours per day for more than three days per week for more than three weeks. So mother or parent bringing in a child, three months old, four months old, um, and they uh, tell you that the child keeps on crying. Okay, the child cries at a specific time on every day, the child cries and no matter whatever we do, he or she doesn't uh, calms down. First of all, we have to reassure them. Then on the history, we have to ask them, is the child wet? Are you changing the diapers frequently? Is the child, um, uh, is he too warm or cold? Uh, like sometimes the parents, they just... Uh, put extra blankets or cover the child um, to make him cozy. So if the child is too warm or cold, ask about that. Ask about uh, changing of the diapers. Is the child hungry? Are they feeding him or her properly? If all of these things are uh, ruled out, then just reassure the parents and tell them that change their breastfeeding techniques or bottle feeding techniques um, um, and the child will uh, come out of it. Okay, there's no specific treatment for it. Just uh, soothing and relaxing techniques are um, are uh, prefer, uh, recommended. Otherwise, there's no specific treatment, just reassurance. 
We're not gonna give the parents any uh, the colic drops or all of these things. We're not gonna give them. Then we have aneurysis. Aneurysis is what? Involuntary urinary incontinence by day or night in a child more than five, uh, five years of age. Okay. So a child uh, more than five years of age presenting with involuntary urinary incontinence. Remember more than five years. Okay. So what is it? It can be primary. The child never attained bladder control or it can be secondary. The child attained bladder control. He, uh, he was well trained. And now after six months or one year, the parents are bringing in the child with a urinary incontinence. So at that point, there will be some underlying cause. If the, 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 the they're bringing a four-year-old child, okay, a four-year-old child is coming with urinary incontinence. What is the next step? Just reassure the parents. He's too small. And uh, he's, uh, he's going to outgrow it. So at four years, we are not doing anything. At five years also, we have to reassure them. At six years, if they're coming in, then what we have to do <clears throat> on history, we have to ask them um, any recent stressors about any recent stressors in life, uh, any uh, are the parents giving him any punishments, then we can tell them about uh, reduced fluid intake or caffeine intake before bedtime, uh, uh, um, suggest them uh, wet alarms along with that if a child is more than seven years old and the parents are bringing them in that he or she has to go uh, for night overs with the friends or with at the school some night camps anything like this so we will give him desmopressin remember more than seven year old child not we are not giving desmopressin to a six year old child or to a five year old child okay at six years just wet alarms but if the parents are coming and they are saying that a six-year-old child and they want him to, uh, he wants to go on some night camp. So tell us something or give us something to prevent uh, his incontinence, then we can give desmopressin. Otherwise, in normal routine, we give it above seven years of age. Secondary, we have to rule out any UTI, any burning, frequency, maturation, um, any diabetes, polyphagia, polyuria. Ask all, uh, all these questions and whatever the underlying cause is, we have to refer the child according to their cause or treat the underlying cause. Okay. Um, in diurnal, it is mostly because, uh, due to maturation deferral. Like the child is uh, holding the urine till the last time. Children, they're busy playing here and there until the last time they just hold it. They don't want to go to the washroom and then um, they can't hold it anymore. So it can be that. Or maybe the child has some constipation. So we have to rule all of these things out. And coparesis, it is the fecal incontinence in child more than four, four years at least once per month for three months. So in uh, aneurysis, if a five-year-old child is coming or a four-year-old child is coming, we have to reassure, right? But in encopresis, if a five-year-old child is coming, then we don't have to reassure. We have to find the underlying cause. Okay, so in this encopresis, mostly the cause is constipation. Okay, it can be constipation um, or the child is holding his uh, poop for the last, till the last moment and th then he just passes it there's some incontinence what do we have to do if there is a um, constipation we have to do uh, uh, on abdominal examination we will find some uh, on physical examination sorry um, yes we will find uh, some mass in the abdomen so we will do uh, on dre there will also be mass and on abdominal x-ray we will see uh, fecal mass what do we have to do we have to give the child a pec 3350 Okay, and if it is a, a lot of constipation and um, uh, even PEC 3350 is not working for the time being, then we have to first do manual re removal and after that we have to give PEC 3350. In um, failure to thrive, uh, there can be so many different causes, maybe due to some uh, cystic fibrosis, maybe uh, some underlying uh, diarrheal, uh, chronic diarrhea. So we have to rule out all of these causes. So they will come one by one and according to the topic. So we can discuss what are the different causes of failure to thrive. The child is the weight is less than three percentile. Okay, in this. 
So he will be less than 3% alpha for the average height uh, weight. So the, at that time, we call it failure to thrive. It can also present with neglect. In a child uh, neglect, the child might present with failure to thrive. Okay. So we have to rule out, first thing we have to rule out is child neglect. Obesity, this is important. So what is obesity? The overweight child, uh, the uh, BMI, two to five years, it will be more than 97th percentile and it will be more than 99.9 percentile. And uh, five to eight, uh, 19 years, more than 85th percentile for overweight and BMI for obese is more than 97th percentile. Mother bringing in a child with, uh, she's concerned that the child is overweight or on history or examination, the, the mother just brings in the child for routine examination and we find that the child is overweight. What is the next step? We have to find the underlying cause. On the history, we have to find like maybe there's any um, history of obesity. First, we have to exclude that. Any history of diabetes, any history of hypothyroidism, uh, was the child obese at birth? Okay, uh, was the mother, did the mother had any uh, diabetes at birth? So we have to rule out all these things. If there is an uh, um, elder, like a uh, teenage girl, we can rule out PCOS also in them if they're presenting with any signs of hirsutism, amenorrhea. Then what are the complications? Hypertension, dyslipidemia, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, type 2 diabetes, asthma, OSA, gynecomatia, PCOS, early menarche, irregular menses, psychological trauma, for example, bullying, decreased self-esteem, and healthy coping mechanisms and depression. Obese child, a teenager coming by himself that he wants to uh, lose weight. What are the two screening questions we have to first ask him? We have to ask him about any uh, depression or any bullying, okay? The child himself is coming, so we have to ask them. Otherwise, what are the things we have to uh, screen him for? We have to screen him for any dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, we'll do ALT and diabetes. But if they're asking you that a 17-year-old boy or a girl is coming to you, she wants to lose weight, Okay, and she's uh, ready to, uh, for the changes. What are the next questions we have to ask? We have to ask her about any depression or any bullying. If the mother is bringing in the child, we have to uh, counsel the mother uh, about the lifestyle modification. We have to tell her to decrease the um, uh, sugar intake. We have to tell her to decrease fat intake encourage more physical activity. If the child is uh, more on screen, we have to tell her that the screen time should be uh, no, should not be more than two hours per day. Okay, so a simple question can be given that a mother bringing in a child, everything is normal, they give you everything. And uh, in the scenario, they're telling you that the child's screen time is four to five hours per day. Okay, uh, so what is the next step? What will you do? No, you see that, okay, everything is normal. Uh, the BMI is fine. Nothing is abnormal. What to do? So remember, the screen time should be less than two hours per day. So we have to counsel on screen time to decrease the screen time. Yeah. Then for poison prevention, we should know that we should keep all the dangerous medications, drugs, any uh, cleaners in the house uh, away from the uh, children in a locked cabinet, okay, where they cannot reach it. Um, and, and for alcoholic beverages, uh, three O's hard liquor can kill a two-year-old child. If they are bringing in a child and the child uh, took some uh, medications, uh, the parents do not know what medications were those, but uh, the, uh, the child took the medications. And on x-ray, if the uh, medications are radiopaque, mostly it is iron supplements, okay? So the iron supplements are radiopaque on x-ray and we have to then uh, uh, do the uh, uh, gastric lavage of the child because uh, a certain amount of iron supplements, they can be harmful for the baby. So radiopaque uh, tablets on uh, x-ray, um, our uh, iron supplements. Okay. For um, rashes, I'll just go generally through them because I have not, I don't have the pictures right now with me. But um, when we do derma, I will share the pictures and um, otherwise you can just go on Google and look for the picture for each of these. Okay, what do they look like? 
Just for diaper dermatitis, um, it is uh, what can be the differentials. It can be either irritant contact, seborrheic, or candidial. Okay, so if you open on the Google, for you write irritant contact dermatitis, so they will give you a picture. For seborrheic, they will give you a uh, picture, so you will know the difference in them. Okay, they can just give you the picture and ask you the management. The management for eight and contact dermatitis is irritate, uh, sorry, eliminate the direct contact, like, tell the parents to regularly change the diaper, okay? And uh, we uh, give them uh, uh, zinc oxide, like uh, those rash creams or Vaseline's, um, recommend, those are recommended. Corticosteroids, they come in very later stages, okay? So if a simple dermatitis, just uh, frequent changes of the diaper, along with them, uh, prescribe them uh, barrier methods like uh, uh, Vaseline or zinc oxide paste. And then for seborrheic dermatitis, these are yellow greasy <coughs> macules. And it can be present on the eyebrows, in the hair, uh, which is also known as um, cradle cap or uh, any part of behind the ears. So that it is going to be the yellow greasy um, papules present uh, on uh, the body. What do we have to do? Uh, frequent moisturizers and topical antifungals. For candidal dermatitis, it is um, if you open the picture, it will be like very red and beefy area. The diaper area of the uh, baby will be very red. Okay, red beefy area for candidal uh, dermatitis. So erythematous, macerated papules, plaque, satellite lesions, involvement of the skin folds. What are we given, giving? Antifungal, clotrimazole, and niacinamide. Then atopic dermatitis, mostly they will give you a history of asthma, a history of allergy, any other family history of dermatitis, atopic dermatitis or asthma. Um, what do we have to do? Frequent uh, hydration with daily baths, moisturizers, and uh, then steroids. Demular dermatitis, um, like a coin shape. It will be like a coin shaped dermatitis on the upper or lower extremities. Um, avoid irritant if identified and we, what are we giving uh, along with the emollients we are giving steroids same for allergic contact dermatitis they will be red papules and bullies and we have to give them calamine lotion and steroids so for mostly all the um, dermatitis what we are giving we are giving remove the agent and give uh, steroids and moisturizers irritant contact dermatitis avoid the same contact as uh, uh, skin contact. Then uh, dishydrotic dermatitis. In this, we have the tapioca pudding. If the any time they are giving a patient coming in and on the hand, the lesions are like a tapioca pudding, then that is dishydrotic dermatitis. We have to give them steroids, topical in mild cases, and in severe cases, systemic steroids with a UVA or uh, treatment. So if uh, these are small um, papules, just Google them and you'll see what is a tapioca pudding. KB's history, parent is bringing in a child. He was um, uh, uh, visiting his cousins or he was uh, on some uh, night camps uh, with the schools and uh, on a school trip. And now the child is presenting with um, and some uh, rash or pr uh, pr uh, pruritus in, um, in the... Uh, what do you call it, web spaces of the fingers on the uh, wrist area. So what is the most probable cause? It is scabies. And in scabies, we have to treat both the family and the um, patient, okay? So permethrin cream, 5% for patient and the family. Remember, the family has to be treated. If you are just writing treat the uh, patient with permethrin, then <clears throat> you'll just get half of the mask marks, okay? In pedigo, these are honey-colored uh, crust. And what are we giving? Topical antibiotics like fusidic acid or mupirocin cream. Atenia corporis, round erythematous plaques, central clearing, and scaly borders. Topical antifungal for skin, systemic antifungal for nail and hands. Then we have sleep disturbance. In children, the OSA presents differently as compared to the adults and the um, 
uh, cause is also different okay so mostly the cause um, like the treatment is different sorry um, in osa in children partial or intermittent complete airway obstruction during sleep causing disrupted ventilation and sleep so the mother might bring in an obese child with a history of uh, like he's irritated most of the time the child is obstructed uh, frustrated more uh, and even he's, he or she is sleeping at the day so we have to rule out um OSA. What is the diagnostic criteria? One plus of the following features, snoring, obstructed breathing, sleepiness, or behavioral problems. So they, they might not give you any snoring, any obstructing breathing. They will just give you that the mother is bringing in a child who is sleeping during the day, although the child is sleeping at night also. Okay. And uh, the child is always agitated or um, has some behavior uh, behavioral issues, irritated all the time. What we have to exclude? We have to exclude OSA. Clinical features, snoring, gasping, noisy breathing during sleep, irritable, tired, hyperactive during the day. Complications are uh, cardiovascular like hypertension, left ventricular remodeling, growth, cognitive and behavioral problems. Etiology, now here the etiology is adenotonsular hypertrophy, craniofacial abnormalities, obesity. So the major cause in children mostly is adenotonsular hypertrophy. And what is the management? We have to do adenotonsillectomy. If they are obese, then a weight management um, and otherwise odinotonsillectomy. And the gold standard is a polysomnography, but it is not done. Routinely, it is not done because there are special sleep clinics where you have to refer them, a special a sleep therapist and a nurse um, and a doctor who has to do it. So mostly they don't. But if they're asking you the gold standard treatment, like investigation, then you have to write polysomnography. But otherwise, don't write the first line treatment is poly, uh, investigation is polysomnography. Yeah. Then in they, you should know the difference between nightmare and night terror. In nightmare, the child is going to get up. He will remember his uh, dream. The nightmare he had, he's going to remember it at that time. Uh, even when he gets up uh, in the morning, he will remember it. Okay. The next day he will remember it. Uh, the child will be calm. He'll just be scared. So what are we doing? We are reassuring the parents. And it happens in the REM sleep pattern. You sure it can be an MCQ question. So remember, this is in the nightmare is in the REM sleep and night terror is in the uh, deep sleep. And in night terror, the parents are bringing in a child. He's waking up every time, uh, every night, same time. Okay. And the child is inconsolable. The parents cannot calm him down. The child does not remember the night, uh, the, uh, the nightmare. And the next morning also when he wakes up, he doesn't remember anything. So that is night terror. In nightmare, he remembers everything and he is easily... He, he calms down and he's normal but in night terror he's the parents cannot uh, calm him down so we have to reassure the parents that the child will outgrow it just tell them that they have to do uh, awake the child up 15 uh, minutes before the uh, pattern every night they know okay at this time the child wakes up so 15 minutes before they have to go and wake him up to disturb that pattern Kids, it is important and uh, traumatizing for the parents. So if a, a parent coming in, bringing a child, the child was all fine and the next morning the child um, is not breathing, the, they find out that the child um, has died. So what we have to do, first thing, we have to provide them with um, bereavement support. We have to provide them with uh, some um, counseling. Okay, so that is the first thing we have to provide them with. Okay. After that, if the uh, what are the uh, risk factors we should know? The risk factors are uh, low birth weight, prematurity, indigenous background, male, then no prenatal care, previous history of said in a sibling, um, a history of smoking in the family, prone uh, sleep position and poverty. These are all the risk factors. Then bed sharing. The child is sleeping in the same bed with the parent or with someone else. And the parents are cons uh, consuming alcohol and are sleeping with the child. So all of these are the risk factors for SIDS. What do we have to counsel? We should always tell them that back to sleep and front to uh, play. Okay, Just remember that back to sleep, the child should sleep in a supine position. Avoid sharing bed with infant, avoid tobacco smoke exposure, avoid overheating and overdressing, appropriate infant bedding, 
exclusive breastfeeding in the first month and no smoking. Pacifier appear to have a protective effect, but do not uh, reinsert if they have uh, fallen out during the sleep. And infant monitors do not reduce insulin. Mother bringing in a child and uh, she's uh, she's very anxious because her previous child, uh, she had experienced it in her previous child. So she wants to avoid it and uh, she heard about infant monitors. Uh, do they help in it or no? So tell her that they do not uh, reduce the incidence. And what are the things we will counsel her on? These th and these all. Okay, so just remember them. If they give you a CDM uh, question, mother bringing in a child, uh, uh, very anxious, previous children have, uh, she has previous children which suffered, said, what are the things we counsel her on? We will counsel her on all these things. <laughs> Then this is the history. If adolescent is coming, what history do we have to ask him? In adolescent, this heads criteria, just remember. Home, education, eating, activities, drug, sexuality, suicide, depression, safety, and violence. And remember, in adolescents, their history, it's same. Their consent, we cannot share it with their uh, parents uh, or anyone. If, even if the uh, father or mother is asking about the history, what did you discuss? Um, a scenario can be given. The father or mother is bringing in a 18-year-old uh, 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 boy or a 16-year-old, 14-year-old boy. Um, he was not feeling well. On history, uh, separately, the uh, boy tells you that I have been taking some drugs. I have been using alcohol, but I do not want you to tell the uh, tell my father. Okay. So what is the next step? The, and now the father is inquiring you that what happened to the child or what did he discuss with you. So just tell him that right now uh, um, we, we won't be telling the father that we cannot disclose with you what the child has uh, told us. Okay, So just tell him that we need uh, to further uh, investigate or right now there, it doesn't seem anything doesn't seem very um, uh, critical Okay, or we need to book another appointment with the boy. So that is what we are going to do. Then the age of consent is 16 years. You should know um, a 16-year-old girl ask, coming to you for uh, OCPs. What is the first thing we have to ask her about her partner? Who is the partner and what is the age of the partner? If she tells you that the age of the partner is uh, like 20 years old and uh, uh, he or... Um, um, he is his coach or teacher or any instructor, we will tell her that we have to report this case, okay? 16-year-old girl coming for uh, OCPs and the uh, partner is in a position of authority, okay? Then we have to, or um, yes, is in a position of authority, then we have to uh, report case. No, even if she says, no, please do not report it, it's with my will, and but still, it cannot be a coach or a teacher, or any person um, uh, who uh, the child is dependent on, okay? Then a 14 or 15 year old can consent as long as the partner is less than uh, five years older. So the difference should be at least four years. If the difference is of four years, okay, uh, they can consent. But if they're coming in for OCPs or any other thing and the partner is uh, more than five years or five years of older, then we have to uh, report it, okay? And as long as there is no relationship of trust, authority, dependency, or exploitation. A 12 or 13 year can consent as long as the partner is less than two years. So what does less than two years mean? That only one year difference. And then as long as there is no relationship of trust, authority, dependency, or exploitation. So any of this thing is being um, um, crossed, the age is being crossed, or there is any other, like the, uh, the he's a dependent or a coach or teacher, we have to report the case. Child uh, neglect or abuse. if even if it is a neglect or abuse, both we have to report uh, to the CAS and we have to tell the parents we will report it, okay? Even if we are just suspecting it, we are not sure about it. We did this in ethics also that we have to report it no matter what. And if the uh, mother is bringing in a child with uh, some uh, a fracture of one limb, 
um, or any bruise somewhere on further uh, assessment, we find that there are multiple fractures. So it is um, child abuse. We have to report to the CAS, even if the mother is neglecting any such thing. We have to, uh, to report CAS. And what will we do? We have to do, if we are report, uh, suspecting a child ab abuse, we have to do a full skeletal survey. Okay. Yes. So we have to do full skeletal survey and then report it. What are the other things we have to exclude? We have to, if the fracture is evident, we have to exclude any calcium, magnesium, phosphate, ALP, parathyroid, vitamin D, albumin. Mainly if they give you the scenario of child abuse, they will just give you bluntly that, okay, everything is fine. And on um, uh, like um, everything is fine, but you're just suspecting on the mother's history is weak. What is the next investigation you are going to do? So you have to do skeletal survey. They will give you all of these things are fine. There's no other, uh, all the investigations are fine. Everything on history is fine or the mother's history is very weak. We have to do the skeletal survey, okay? And report to CAS. For sexual abuse, we did it. It's the same way, the one we did in OPS and gynae. And what is the presentation of neglect? Failure to thrive, developmental delay, inadequate or dirty clothing, poor hygiene, child exhibits poor attachment to the parents and no stranger anxiety, okay? So any of this is present, you have to suspect neglect or abuse. Cardiology, I am mm, not a cardio person, but still I'll just tell you what is important. The, you just should just know at what condition, uh, what murmur is there and what, because for all the uh, this cardiology in pediatrics, the investigation, diagnostic investigation is echo, okay? And what are we doing? We are referring them for surgical um, repair, except for one or two, which we should know, okay? So what are the congenital heart diseases? They are asynotic and synotic. In asynotic, ASD, VSD, PDA, and the obstructive coagulation of the aorta, aortic stenosis, and pulmonic stenosis. For uh, cyanotic, we have all the T's, okay? Tetralogy of phthalate, transposition of the great arteries, truncus arteriosus, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, tricuspid atresia. So just remember in cyanotic, we have all the T's, and in asynotic, the rest of the um, ASD, VSDs, we have PDA. If they're giving you any of the uh, chest X-ray finding, know this, then you will know. Boot-shaped heart is in tetralogy of fillet and tricuspid atresia. X-shaped heart, transposition of the great arteries. Snowman heart, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. In AST, what is there? The finding is that there is a fixed S2, widely split and fixed S2 is there. Okay, and children, if it is small, it can be a, like asymptomatic. And children with large AST may have signs of heart failure, that is tachypnea, failure to thrive, hepatomegaly, pulmonary rails, or retraction. What are we doing? Chest X-ray, ECG, and the diagnosis is echo. And we have to refer to cardiology for the repair. VST, most common congenital heart disease, uh, on physical examination, there will be uh, early systolic to holosystolic murmur, okay, at the left uh, lower sternal border. So if they're giving you a scenario, a child coming in on examination, there is a uh, murmur heard at the left lower sternal border or holosystolic murmur. So it is VST. Uh, investigation, same. We have to do ECG, chest X-ray. They will be normal and the diagnostic is, in all of these is diagnostic is echo and refer. Okay. Then uh, PDA, patent ductus, uh, ductus arteriosus. Clinical features, apneic or uh, bradycardiac spells. Okay, poor feeding, accessory muscle use. Physical examination, tachycardia with or without gallop rhythm, bounding pulses, hyperactive precordium, wide pulse pressure, continuous machinery murmur. In, the, in all of these conditions, if you know the type of murmur, because they will give you the type of murmur, okay? So if you know, okay, in PDA, we have a machinery murmur. In the MCQ question, they have given you a machinery murmur. So what is it? It can be PDA, 
what do we have to give? We have to give endomethacine and after that, uh, refer for the surgical repair or closure. Okay. Then in coactation of the aorta, there will be the difference of pulses in upper and lower extremities. What do we give? We, div we give a prostaglandin to keep the ductus arteriosus patent for stabilization and then uh, refer for uh, balloon arterioplasty. It can be, th these are just the MCQ question. Very rarely anybody, they do give like a MCQ question, giving you the type of uh, murmur and what is, uh, what is the cause, what can be the underlying cause. ASD, VSD, PDA, and TOF, like this, okay? In aortic stenosis, physical examination, what is the history? Often asymptomatic, but may be associated with congenital heart failure. Is the exertional chest pain, syncope, or sudden death? Physical examination, systolic ejection murmur at right upper sternal border with aortic ejection click at the apex. Investigations are echo for diagnosis. Management is balloon vulvoplasty. A surgical repair. Stenosis, um, the inadequate pulmonary blood flow dependent on ductus arteriosus for oxygenation and progressive hypoxia and cyanosis. It may be uh, present along with TOF or congenital rubella or Noonan syndrome. Clinical features, wide split S2 on expiration, systolic ejection murmur at the left upper sternal border and pulmonary ejection click. Diagnostic finding, echo, and repair. Cyanotic. Okay, if a child is coming in, the newborn or a neonate, and the mother is bringing it, maybe a one-month-old child, now, uh, and the child turns blue, okay, after feeding or after crying, after some time, now we have to differentiate whether it is an um, uh, underlying heart uh, cardiac cause or it is a respiratory cause. We will do, what are we doing? We have to do the hyperoxic test. Okay, this uh, I've seen this as a CDM question that a uh, um, mother bringing in a child and the child becomes like cyanosed and they're giving you the history. What is the next uh, one investigation we have to do or next step? So we will write hyperoxic test to differentiate whether it is a uh, uh, cardiac cause or respiratory cause. Okay, just know the name. Then in TOF, what uh, what is the history? History of TET spells. What are TET spells? That the, uh, during exertional states, uh, the increasing pulmonary vascular resistance and decrease in uh, systemic resistance causes an increase in right to left shunting. The child will present with paroxysms of rapid and deep breathing, irritability, crying, increased cyanosis, decreased intensity of murmur, patient squatting for relief, Okay, and if severe, can lead to decreased level of consciousness, seizures, and death. Uh, what is the um, investigation on chest X-ray? There will be a boot-shaped heart, decreased pulmonary vasculature, and right aortic arch. Um, management for TET spells, what are we giving? We are giving um, oxygen, uh, knee chest position, fluid bolus, morphine sulfate, propanolol, phenylephrine, and surgical repair. Then transposition of the great artery is most common cyanotic congenital heart disease in the neonates. This is not very important. They don't ask. The physical examination is ductus arteriosus closure causes rapidly progressive severe hypoxemia, unresponsive to oxygen therapy, acidosis, and death. Okay. CHF in the first week of life. And with same on chest X-ray, we have an X-shaped heart. And what are we giving? We are giving prostaglandin E1 and then surgical repair. Then what is Epstein anomaly? If the mother is uh, presenting with a history of uh, lithium and benzodiazepine use in the first trimester, okay? So the child can have Epstein anomaly. So just know that uh, lithium or benzodiazepine in the first trimester, what is the complication? Epstein anomaly. Treatment will be same. We have to refer and everything. Congestive heart failure, the child presenting with features of congestive heart failure, it will be the same. Along with that, what are the four key features? Tachycardia, tachypnea, cardiomegaly, hepatomegaly. Okay, and infants, they will be weak cry, irritable, feeding difficulties, um, diaphoresis um, while sleeping or respiratory distress, lethargy, failure to thrive. So 
this congestive heart failure, it is mainly in the uh, cardio also. If they give you any scenario, it is mostly important for the adults and children, the more, but just remember the treatment is the same. That LMNOP, which we did for the adults, the same, the congestive heart failure for children also, okay? The same treatment, setting up position, oxygen, sodium, water restriction, uh, increase uh, caloric intake, and we're giving uh, diuretics. Okay. Then we have approach to developmental delay. Okay. Um, so I get stuck. Okay. So in this um, developmental delay, what type of question they can give you? A mother bringing in a child like four years of age, he's not speaking, he's not talking, just saying uh, two words or three words. Um, like this, any speech delay they will give you, any a milestone delay they can give you. So according to the history, if the child is four years of age, what is the one question, first question we have to ask? Like we have to check his hearing. If the child is uh, four years of age, five years of age, he's not talking, just saying one to two words. So first we have to do his hearing test, okay? We have to take a proper history, ask the parent whether... If you call him, does the child respond or not, does not respond? You call him from another room, does he respond? Um, all these things, they come in history, okay? So it is more a knack point of view, more important. In intellectual, they're coming, then they will give you some underlying history like any uh, hypothyroidism, um, any speech delay, any uh, school delays and uh, delay in the school. So management is just uh, refer them to some uh, occupational therapy, speech language pathologist, social services, or family therapy, all of this we have to do. Same for no universally accepted definition, most often identified around 18 months of age with enhanced well baby visits. If formally tested, at least one standard deviation below mean of age on standardized. So if a mother is bringing in an 18 month old child, just saying two, three words, then uh, it's okay. We will just reassure them. Okay. But if an uh, elder child is coming in, then there is, we have to exclude other causes. Okay. If the child has some learning problems in the school and you find out that the, um, he is uh, below uh, his um, uh, age for that uh, specific learning um, and academic performance, what our job as a physician then will be, we have to provide or write a letter to the principal or the uh, school for the school support. Okay, even if they say that, okay, there's a waiting list in the uh, school and um, for that, the child will uh, has, has to wait uh, two, three months or six months. We as a physician, we will uh, provide advocate for his school support. Okay. And uh, individualized education plan, a written plan that describes the strength and needs of the student. So we will have to do our job. We can't, If they have given in the scenario that, okay, the child has this uh, um uh, disability learning disability or he is below his academic in the school uh, and the parents are bringing him in uh, because uh, in the school the support system for that he has to wait okay what we have to do we have to uh, provide them with a school support letter okay we won't say that okay it is a process they have he should wait and this and that no we will do our job rest it is the job of the school and the administration whether they will follow it or no um, alcohol spectrum disorder, there will be spe uh, specific uh, features which they are going to give you, okay? And what are those features? Short palpable fissure, flattened philtrum, thin upper lip, if these are present, okay? And even in the history, the mother is giving that she did not take alcohol during the pregnancy. Even then, it is fetal alcohol syndrome, Okay. So they will give you a scenario, uh, MCQ mostly, MCQ uh, telling you about these uh, features or uh, showing you a picture of a baby with these features, okay? So what is the cause? 
uh, it is fetal, fecal alcohol syndrome. What do we have to do? Our management will be to provide them with support and uh, therapies. Okay. Then diabetes, it's the same we did in um, family medicine, right? So it's the same. We just have to uh, know that uh, if a child is coming with diabetes or if uh, then we, if, a, if it's a girl, okay, with PCOS, then we have to uh, exclude diabetes also in her. A child first time presenting with DKA, then it can be diabetes, okay? So he will be diabetic. We have to counsel him, provide them with different supports, tell them if it's first, uh, if it's uh, di uh, diabetes mellitus type 1, then the screening will start after five years. We will start them on insulin therapy. And so all of this, the, the same we did on um, in family medicine. Same, the thing is different. Same complications, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. If, if, if there's a family history, then the screening will start. In children, when do we screen for type 2 diabetes? If When? If they are obese or overweight, okay, and uh, after puberty, or more than 10 years old, if one or more risk factors is present. So if a child coming in, uh, uh, coming in and he's obese, we have to screen them for diabetes. Okay. or they have a family history of uh, type 2 diabetes or they uh, uh, belong from a high-risk ethnic group like South Asians. They are high risk for type 2 diabetes. Risk of insulin resistance, gestational diabetes. Any of this is present, okay, any one of this is present, then we have to screen him at 10 years. More than 10, no, so not at 10 years, we'll start screening at 11 years, okay. How will we screen them? We will screen them with plasma glucose or to our oral glucose tolerance test or hemoglobin A1C. The treatment is the same. Start them if the A1C is very high, we start them on insulin. Um, glycemic index is met, uh, transfer to metformin, and same lifestyle modification and everything. Short stature of mother bringing in a child um, that he or she is very short as compared to other uh, of his uh, classmates. Okay, so what do we have to do? We have to take the history, ask about the parental height, and what are the two investigations we are doing? We have to do the mid-parental height and uh, X-ray AP of the wrist um, of left hand and wrist for bone age. Okay, so these two investigations we have to uh, do and if it is a constitutional delay just reassure the mother okay these hormonal therapies we don't uh, give them very often they have their own side effects also so if the mother is coming in for uh, that okay i want to give the uh, hormonal therapy then we have to counsel her also okay congenital hyperthyroidism uh, mother will have a history of hyperthyroidism during pregnancy or before that, um, and the child will present with um, uh, what uh, at birth it can be a low birth weight, IUGR, microcephaly, premature birth, tachycardia, irritability, frontal bossing, okay, triangular fasces. All of this the, can be present in the children. What do we have to do? We have to do the uh, TSH. Um, levels. First, we will do the TSH levels, and then we have to do TSH receptor antibody levels. And that is also done in the mother. In children, if they're presenting with uh, signs of hyperthyroidism, we have to do the TSH level. The treatment is uh, give um, methimazole and uh, beta blockers propanolol. Okay. For congenital hypothyroidism, mother bringing in a child with a history of constipation. Okay, mother bringing in a child with a history of constipation and uh, in the school, he is uh, below uh, his academic performance. So this can be the scenario they can give. On examination, if it's a neonate, uh, if child coming in with history of constipation since childhood, along with this intellectual disability, we have to do the TSH levels. Um, there will be some other uh, features they will give you in the scenario. 
at birth if they are giving you that the child presents with prolonged jaundice feeding difficulty lethargy constipation umbilical hernia macroglossia large fontanelle puffy face swollen eyes hypotonia what are these all of these are the features of hypothyroidism the mother had hypothyroidism and now the baby is born with any of these features or the mother didn't give you any history of mother suffering from hypothyroidism so we have to do the tsh levels okay first thing we have to always do the tsh for thyroid hyper hyper do the tsh levels then in hypothyroidism what are we doing we thyroid is less just replace that give thyroxine replacement okay Then we have okay. Um. Then we have. Um, Ask a question. Sorry. Just. Where were we? Yes. Okay. So ambiguous genitalia. In this, um, the thing that is important is mainly this congenital adrenal hyperplasia but that is also uh, more of a you know u.s assembly sort of thing they don't ask that much but we should not still okay what is 46 xy in bar error of testosterone biosynthesis 5 alpha reductase deficiency androgen receptor deficiency or insensitivity lh or hcg unresponsiveness 46 xx that is congenital adrenal hyperplasia or maternal source. Uh, then over testicular DST, both ovarian follicles and seminiferous tubules in the same patient with a 46XX karyotype. Okay. What are the uh, clinical features? Clinical features will be thorough obstetric. Uh, we have to take the history. After proper history, we have to do the physical examination. On physical examination, if it's X, it's Y, we will see small phallus, hypospadias, bilateral cryptorchidism, and excess clitoromegaly, labioscrotal fusion. Okay. Investigation, karyotyping, and genetic workup. Um, then in blood work, electrolytes, renin because of the salt wasting uh, syndrome in CH17 hydroxyprogesterone level, androgens, FSH, LH and glucose Man imaging is abdominal and pelvic ultrasound uh, management will be psychosocial support for parents and a child during development now if uh, at birth we see a child who has ambiguous genitalia or something like this is abnormal we won't just uh, bluntly tell the parents remember that okay we just uh, the parents uh, will just come out and tell the parents that okay your child has this no First, we always have to do the karyotyping. We have to assure that everything is, uh, there is something underlying cause. Okay, then uh, um, take the parents into confidence and tell them, okay, what if we are wrong then? So it's a big issue for parents also. And what do we have to do? If anything abnormal is found out, we have to provide them with psychosocial support for the parents. That is very important. Then in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, auto, uh, it is autosomal recessive disorder characterized by partial or total defect of various synthetic enzymes required for cortisol and aldosterone production in the adrenal cortex. What does it produce? Normally, adrenal cortex it produces aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. So what happens? There is a 21 hydroxylase. There will be a deficiency of that in this uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. As a result, there will be a decreased cortisol and aldosterone and increased uh, um, androgens. So the child will present with uh, increased virilization, increased sex uh, uh, steroids. So all of those, um, there will be increase in him, him or her whatever. Okay, the classic deficiency with child wasting and uh, without uh, salt wasting. So classic deficiency with salt wasting, inadequate aldosterone resulting in failure to thrive, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, and acidosis. Okay, and this, all of this will be deficient. Decreased cortisol, decreased aldosterone. So they will, uh, the sign and symptoms of decreased aldosterone and cortisol will be present. Okay. And without salt wasting, only virilization will be present. And these symptoms of salt wasting like aldosterone and cortisol deficiency won't be there. 
Males typically asymptomatic at birth may show hyperpigmentation, penile enlargement, rapid growth, and accelerated skeletal maturation. Non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia, mild androgen excess, sometimes asymptomatic, uh, precocious puberty, or virilization presents later in life. So if it is mild, maybe a teenager is coming to you or someone later in life is coming to you with symptoms of virilization and uh, all these precocious puberty, then we have to exclude this out. What is the test we have to do uh, in congenital adrenal hyperplasia? We have to do 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels, okay? If 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels are high, it means that 21 hydroxylase is less. So don't write, uh, we, uh, we have to do 21 hydroxylase level. No, we have to do 17. 21 hydroxylase is deficient and the test we are doing, we are testing for 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Treatment is we will give both glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. <clears throat> and then this is the different uh, stages of uh, puberty and what are the development at what age, what stage is there, okay? Okay, if a girl is, mother is bringing in a girl seven years of age with early puberty uh, or early menarche, then it is mostly normal. We have to just um, reassure it, okay? But if the boy is coming, a male is coming, then uh, there is something, mostly it is some pathological causes underlying pathological causes there. Okay, dehydration, it is very important. You should know what is mild, moderate, and severe dehydration. First, a child is coming in, we have to take a proper history. We have to ask about the number of diapers and any symptoms of uh, all the symptoms of dehydration. Okay, so uh, in... Uh, Mild dehydration, uh, only slightly uh, the urine output will be decreased and the oral mucosa will be dry. Everything else will be normal. And moderate, oral mucosa will be dried, uh, urine output will be decreased, blood pressure might be a little low to normal, uh, anterior fontanella are sunken, eyes are sunken, okay? And capillary refill may be normal. In severe, everything will be marked, okay? Uh, pulse will be rapid and weak, uh, decreased in shock, the blood pressure will be decreased, and urea, parched oral mucosa, markedly sunken, um, fontanella, eyes, is, um, and capillary refill will be more than three seconds. So if it is mild to moderate um, uh, dehydration, we will give oral uh, rehydration therapy, okay? So we'll give the oral fluids, we'll start with them. But if it is severe, then we have to start with um, IV fluids, okay? And in IV fluids, this, uh, where did it go? Yes, you should know this rule of four, this formula. They will give you uh, a child coming in like a nine kg child, okay? So what is the maintenance fluid you are giving? If you know this formula, you will be able to calculate it. If you do not know the formula, you won't be able to calculate. Or they'll just give you an MCQ, uh, um, the values. So which one is the correct? So if first one to 10 kgs, how much we are giving? Four cc per kg per hour. So four cc per kg means we have to multiply, okay? So four, if the child is nine kg, we will multiply four by nine. So how much we are giving? We are giving 36 cc per hour, okay? If the child is 10, <clears throat> excuse me, if the child is 10 kg, we are multiplying 10 with four. So 40 cc per kg, uh, sorry, per hour. Similarly, after 10 kg, then 11 to 20 kg, what we have to do? Add uh, 40 plus 2 cc. So if the child is, uh, suppose, uh, 12 kg, okay? So what will we do? We will multiply 2 by 4. So it will make, uh, because 10 we already have, okay? 40 cc for 10. Now next we have to do, so 1 and 2, 11 and 12. So 2 into 4 will be, um, sorry, 2 into 2 will be 4. So how much are we giving? We are giving 44 cc per kg, yes? Then more than 20 kg, 60 cc plus one cc <clears throat> per kg per hour. Also know the maintenance fluid, okay? This, this is important, okay? Newborn, what are we giving for maintenance? Uh, dextrose water, 10%. 
okay first month of life we are giving dextrose just remember this uh, these values as such okay like in first month we are giving 5% dextrose with 0.45 normal saline plus uh, potassium chloride 20 milli equivalent mm -hmm. children without special consideration we have to go uh, give a uh, dextrose water 5% normal saline plus um, potassium chloride uh, 20 milli equivalent okay so uh, just know these three values it is an mcq question um the, or a cdm question where they they will give you so many different uh, values and they will ask you that which uh, what is the maintenance fluid we are starting the babe, the child on so remember this <clears throat> Then uh, same like for uh, sodium replacement, we have to do it slowly due to the risk of uh, cerebral edema and no more than 12 millimole per, uh, per liter per day should be increased. Once <clears throat> uh, uh, continue to monitor fluid, so acute uh, accurate monitoring of daily fluid intake uh, and ongoing losses. Once the child is like along with that fluid what we have to monitor we have to monitor the intake and the output of the uh, fluid that is it okay so this is important and this is important this is a cdm question they can give you okay for vomiting there can be different dds what are the causes? These are all the causes of vomiting. A neonate coming uh, with excessive secretion soon after birth, drooling, choking, respiratory distress, inability to feed, cyanosis, and uh, MSS vomiting. What we have to do, uh, we are if the uh, we pass the NG tube and the NG tube does not pass on, and we do the X ray and we see the NG tube is curled up in the chest. So what is it? It is tracheoesophageal fistula. What we have to do, we have to refer uh, to the surgery, pediatric surgery for further um, repair. Then pyloric stenosis. Um, what will the mother bring in a child? Uh, will bring in a child with a non bilious projectile vomiting after feeding, and then uh, while changing the diaper, she noticed that uh, the child has some uh, mass in the uh, upper abdomen or the belly. So on a physical examination, you will see that there's an olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. What do we have to do? We have to do the CBC, electrolytes, burn creatinine, ultrasound, upper GI series. They come later on, okay? So just CBC electrolyte. And then after the correction of the electrolytes, we have to refer for uh, to the surgery. Good. The mother will bring in a child who is uh, after uh, feeding their uh, uh, spits of uh, milk and we have to ask whether it is digested, undigested milk. There's um, arching of the back, poor weight gain, fussiness, the child is always crying. Um, we have to start on the uh, trial of PPI. Along with that, counsel the mother that give the baby, uh, don't uh, burp the baby properly, then uh, keep the head up, um, give uh, thickened feeds, all these things we have to do. Sepsis, hypo or hyperthermia, the mother will bring in the child with signs of sepsis, tachycardia, fever, um, do the CBC, blood cultures, urine cultures, according to the history. Then we have uh, intestinal obstruction. Uh, it can be malrotation with valvulus, meconium alias. So in, in this, they will present with bilious MSs, bilious vomiting, abdominal distension, pain, bloody stools, and shock. Now, all of these in which there's bilious MSs, what are we doing? We are doing abdominal x-ray, okay? So remember the first investigation is abdominal x-ray and all of these. Then du duodenal atresia, uh, what we have to do? Uh, sorry, it is uh, common in Down syndrome, okay? A patient with Down syndrome coming with features of bilious MSs um, or a history of mother having a history of polyhydromnia during the pregnancy, then there are A. coli stools, most probably it is duodenal atresia. Uh, what we have to do, uh, abdominal x-ray and then refer. If they give you an x-ray showing double bubble sign, refer or what can be the child, the typical features of the child in Down syndrome. Her spring disease, uh, 
uh, in this bilious MSAs, abdominal distension, um, pain, failure to pass stool. What are we doing? Abdominal x-ray, same. And um, nectarizing enterocolitis. Uh, in this, um, same signs of fever and um, bilious MSAs, bloody stools, abdominal distension. We have to do abdominal on the x-ray um, look at the x-ray of this enterocolitis okay you should know x-ray of all of these this x-ray there will be air in the um, muscular uh, area so there will be air so that is the diagnostic for enterocolitis and necrotizing enterocolitis okay we have to do blood culture start on antibiotics then if it is viral gastroenteritis, history of fever, diarrhea, some upper respiratory tract infection, the child is in daycare, other children also have the same symptoms, and uh, maybe he traveled recently, we will just, uh, we won't do any investigation and uh, just uh, give the, uh, reassure the parents that it is going to be fine and give him some oral rehydration therapy. But if there are some uh, red flags, like the uh, the child has blood in the um, uh, stool okay or blood in vomitus um, any other uh, red flag is present or it is severe for more than uh, uh, four to five days seven days then uh, we have to uh, do some uh, underlying investigations we will do uh, cbc stool culture and sensitivity maybe the child was hospitalized and now after some time he is um he was hospitalized for some fever, sepsis, UTI, and after one week, two weeks, the parents are bringing him in with diarrhea. So most probably the cause is Clostridium difficile. So we have to do Clostridium difficile toxin. Appendicitis, uh, there will be pain in the right lower quadrant, fever, anorexia, the typical features of appendicitis. We'll do abdominal ultrasound and um, refer surgical to surgery. Intersusception, parents bringing in a child with, uh, they just changed the diaper and the diaper, there was blood, red currant jelly stool. <clears throat> and on history, they are get, telling you that while the child cries, he uh, pulls his uh, legs or draws his legs above towards the chest. Okay. So what is the diagnostic? And uh, for intersusception, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, investigation is uh, air enema. Okay. So if they're asking you what is the next uh, investigation we do or uh, what is the diagnostic test, uh, then it is air enema. It is both therapeutic and diagnostic. No, uh, Non-GI infection like meningitis, pyelonephritis, acute otitis media, they will give you the history of meningitis like Kernig sign, Brzezinski sign, vomiting, fever, um, rash, um, uh, in otitis media, the child withdraws uh, his arm towards the ear or pulls his ears, tugs on his ears. So all of these things will be given in the history. We have to do the uh, culture and sensitivity and antibiotic start. Increased intracranial pressure, same uh, morning awakening, uh, sorry, nocturnal uh, awakening, then headache uh, at the morning time, gait disturbance, brain CT without contrast, toxic ingestion, pregnancy and the cyclic vomiting okay in cycling vomiting a mother will bring in a child okay and she will uh, the child will be vomiting like once every month for they have an episode of vomiting once a month like three episodes of vomiting um for one two days then it come, becomes better then like they, they will come with the history of at least three months of this and everything you do is fine so it will be just diagnosis of exclusion, just reassure the mother and just give some antiemetic that it is, there's nothing um, underlying, there's no underlying cause and just reassurance and provide with some antiemetics. That's it. The GERD, same. I just told you everything about it. There's nothing extra different. The conservative management is thickened feet, frequent or smaller feet, the elevation of the head, changing formula to hydrolyzed protein or amino acid-based formula, starting solids if age appropriate, breastfeeding infants, uh, elimination, uh, like mother will eliminate uh, milk, beef, soya, egg from her diet, and start uh, that uh, PPIs. Okay, then we have diarrhea. 
Diarrhea, same. They, if they will give you diarrhea, that is like they are asking, like, look for the signs of dehydration, how to manage it. Okay, any red flags, uh, exclude those red flags, like bloody stool, fever, pitaki, purpura, signs of severe dehydration, weight loss, or failure to thrive, if it is acute diarrhea. Okay, if acute diarrhea, there are no red flags, no investigation. But if acute diarrhea, there are red flags, then we have to do the investigation according to the call, like stool culture and sensitivity, ova and parasites, uh, electron microscopy for viruses, clostridium difficile toxin microscopy. If there is a, a chronic diarrhea with a history of long-term diarrhea, then there can be different causes, right? And we have to exclude those causes. What co uh, can those be as, is it? Yeah, okay, let's do this then. First, do this toddler's diarrhea, then we'll go, these are all chronic diarrhea, okay? And toddler diarrhea, what will, the mother, she will bring in a child who is <clears throat> 12 months old or six months, eight months old, just started on uh, uh, solids and now <clears throat> the child has uh, recurrent diarrhea. Okay, watery diarrhea. On history, she's telling that um, the uh, child takes a lot of fruit juices. Okay, increase, there's increased fluid intake and there's increased intake of junk food. So what we have to do, we have to tell them, uh, reassure the mother Tell her to uh, increase fiber diet, stop the fruit juices, decrease them, and um, yes, um, and reduce like the fat content should be 35 to 40 percent. So mainly it is the, in management what we have to tell. We have to write reassurance, uh, stop uh, fruit juices or discourage them, discourage, okay, excess fruit juice and adequate fiber intake. So this is the uh, CDM answer, okay? Reassurance, adequate fiber, and discourage excessive fruit juice. Then chronic diarrhea, there can be different cause. Mother bringing in a child with a history, maybe the child is adopted, okay? Uh, it is not her, uh, she just adopted the child two, three months ago, and she has noticed that the child uh, has a diarrhea. Okay, and there's some abdominal distension also, and mostly if the child takes some uh, uh, dairy products, uh, he, he or she has more um, um, a watery diarrhea. Then what we have to do, we have to, uh, there's no family history. She won't even give any family history. We have to start a trial of lactose-free diet. And what will we do? We will give them uh, uh, lectees, uh, drops or uh, tablets. So mainly if they're coming with a history of bloating, abdominal pain associated with di dairy intake, no family history. So first we have to do a trial of lactose-free diet. For celiac disease, <clears throat> mother bringing in a six-month-old, seven-month-old child uh, with, um, previously the child was fine, but now since the introduction of solid food, the child has diarrhea. Okay, this is going to be the presentation in a small child who just started solids and now they have um, uh, diarrhea. What uh, we have to do, we have to, um, the investigation is a transglutaminase antibody test we are doing, TTTT, fecal elastase test we are doing, and then we have to exclude gluten from the di uh, diet. In older children, it will present with poor weight gain, poor appetite, irritability, apathy, rickets, wasted muscles, flat buttocks, really distended abdomen. GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, edema, anemia, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. <clears throat> non GI manifestations of celiac disease are iron deficiency anemia. You should know these, okay? Iron deficiency anemia, dermatitis hepatiformis, um, dental enamel hypoplasia, osteoporosis, short stature, stature, delayed puberty, and behavioral changes. Even a, a, a teenage or adolescent coming with uh, symptoms of um, celiac disease, okay, or long-term history of celiac disease. So what are the complications they can have or long-term uh, problems they can have? This We should know this, okay? And uh, the treatment is a gluten-free diet. And the investigations are um, and TTG levels, okay? Anti-transglutaminase antibodies levels and IgA antibodies also. Then cow milk allergy, there are two types, IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated. In IgE-mediated, they will 
present with the signs and symptoms of uh, like anaphylaxis. So it will be the same treatment. Okay, uh, immediate urticaria, pruritus, anaphylactic reaction, wheezing, cough, cannot breathe. So we have to immediately give them epinephrine. And um, but for non-IgA mediated, they may present even after weeks or months of taking the milk. Okay, so they will have bloody diarrhea, vomiting, uh, any um, anemia, abdominal pain. So these are the uh, symptoms of non-IgA mediated. What are the investigations we have to do? Food challenge test, skin prick test, allergy test, and uh, stop the in IgA mediated, just stop the exposure. And non-IgA mediated, we will introduce them to, uh, we'll ask the mother to first to continue breastfeeding. Okay, ask her to continue breastfeeding, remove any products uh, containing the cow milk or bovine milk from uh, even mother's diet. Okay, from the baby's diet and from the mother's diet also. Okay, this cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis is important. You should know the autosomal pattern, okay? Uh, the question I uh, posted yesterday, that is very important. You should know which is autosomal recessive disease, autosomal dominant, X-linked recessive, X-linked dominant, and what are their um, pattern of... Um, inheritance. So for cystic fibrosis, they can give you a, a question, the child with a history of uh, recurrent respiratory infections, recurrent um, uh, like uh, the constipation since uh, birth, uh, upper respiratory tract infections, what is the test we are doing, failure to thrive. Um, uh, so we have to do the um, uh, sweat chloride test in this child. Okay, and what we have to do next, we will provide with them uh, um, genetic counseling to the parents and the children and uh, pro, uh, uh, refer them to uh, some social support services and uh, continuous uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement. This is what we are doing. And they can give you a, a couple coming in, they want to conceive and both of them have are carriers for cystic fibrosis. And they want to ask what is the our chance chances of our baby having the fibrosis, uh, the disease being uh, in the children. So you should know if they are carriers. So what is the chance? One in um, like twenty five percent chance is the uh, one child one in four will have the uh, disease. Should know this. If one has the disease and other is fine, then what is the chance? Then for constipation. Mostly, uh, they will. Uh, a mother will bring in a child who um, who has like incontinence, like uh, spoiling, uh, soiling of his uh, uh, under uh, underwear uh, with stool. So the cause is uh, constipation. And what we have to do in constipation, we give them a peg thirty three fifty, and increase uh, fluid intake, increase dietary fibers and appropriate educate them about the uh, toilet training techniques and it will be present in um, children who are being um, a toilet trained okay appendicitis same abdominal ultrasound treatment is surgical complication is perforation and deception as i still told you were there this air anema, diagnostic and therapeutic. Okay, then we have chronic abdominal pain. Okay, so for chronic abdominal pain, this is the functional abdominal pain that is uh, uh, important, okay? The mother is bringing in a child um, perfectly fine, no history, uh, physical examination, everything is fine, but uh, the child uh, presents with abdominal pain early in the morning during the week uh, weekdays, okay? On weekends, the mother will say the child is fine, but on uh, weekends, uh, so, uh, sorry, on weekdays, the child has abdominal pain at the morning time, and then rest of the day, the child is fine. On weekends, the child is fine. So what we have to tell, it is a diagnosis of exclusion, we will do fecal studies. Now, in a CDM question, they will give you, okay, the mother is bringing in a child. 
and they will in the history they will tell you that okay at during the week uh, weekdays uh, the child has uh, abdominal pain uh, because of which he has to skip the school but on the weekdays the child is perfectly fine what is the next um, investigation uh, you will do after doing the appropriate uh, uh, physical examination and taking the history investigation you will do we will do fecal studies okay because it is a diagnosis of exclusion we have to do the underlying studies then after doing the fecal studies, they will ask you, what is your next step in management? So sometimes you get confused. Okay, we did the study and now there's no management, but they're still asking the management. So, so we go back and we change our answer. So remember, they want to know that are you reaching, like going the stepwise process or no? So if you have written fecal studies, don't change it. Just go to the answer. If the next on the, the next question is, what is the management? This is the management. Okay, there is no management. Just tell the mother, counsel her that the child will attend the school. The uh, Just provide them with some cognitive behavior therapy or co uh, counseling. Don't write any medications and this and that. Just reassurance. Reassurance, continue to attend school and a cognitive behavior therapy. Sometimes they just want to see that... Uh, because we think that, okay, they have asked us some management, so maybe our diagnosis is wrong. Maybe there's something else. Maybe they just, they just, they just want you to write reassurance. Okay. That's it. Hematology will do it tomorrow. Okay, because I'm also tired. Okay.